True fact about George Clooney. <laughs> Story begins with a guy named Gerald Barnes. Now, Barnes lived to work. Every day he received patients into his office like he's receiving visitors into his home. And after 20 years, this consummate bedside manner was well rewarded. Barnes was appointed head physician and medical director at Executive Health Group in Los Angeles. No ordinary medical practice. Barnes was personally tasked with overseeing the health checkups of members of the FBI, California Highway Patrol, senior officials in the Federal Reserve Bank, among others. Just one problem. Gerald Barnes never went to medical school. <laughs> what was his training? His now ex-wife recalls that Gerald's favourite TV show was a hospital drama, ER. <laughs> George Clooney taught Gerald Barnes how to act like a doctor. But what does it mean to act like a doctor? Barnes had scant medical knowledge. For around two decades, he was relying on his own gut instincts about how well he was pulling off the act. But here's the next surprise. So do accredited doctors. Doctors lack professional insight. Now that statement may strike you as strange, even insulting. Surely doctors are the foremost experts on what it is they do. Wrong. I'm a cognitive scientist, and I'm going to show you why medicine needs outsiders. Current medicine is being played like a game, and the fortune of good health is like Russian roulette. Genetics, access to health care, even relative social inequalities can load a bullet in the spinning chamber of the gun. But I'm not going to talk about the politics of healthcare systems or demographic issues. I'm going to tell you about the bullets that you didn't know existed. Because after you've made your appointment and you're sitting in the consultation room, how you perceive your doctor and how your doctor perceives you in turn can influence your health outcome. I'm going to talk about medicine's psychological problems. Here are the hard facts. Money talks. Patients of a higher socioeconomic status receive an average of 20% more time with their doctor, more positive talk, and better explanations for their health problems. Skin color matters. In the United States, around 13% of the population identifies as African American but just under 4% of medical doctors are black. And that's one factor that may be leading to health inequalities. Take just one example, cardiac patients. Black patients presenting with the same clinical need as white patients are three times less likely to be referred for cardiac surgery. And even in the same hospital, with the same health insurance package, black patients receive less catheterization, less angioplasty, less bypass surgery. Ageism is rife. You know, prolonging life isn't medicine's only goal. But too often, doctors are relying on patients' chronological age rather than their biological age, a fact that's been recognized by the National Cancer Institute in the States. Age may be a barrier to treatment. Here's one example. Around 50% of breast cancer patients are over the age of 65, yet only 8% of that demographic was recently invited on the drug trials. And if you're one of a third of the population of the developed world who's clinically obese, studies show that around 50% of doctors will readily label you lazy, awkward, and non-compliant attitudes that aren't lost on patients, but they may also be leading to health differentials. Again, one example. 
With your clinically obese, you've got a 50% increased chance of developing colorectal cancer. But studies show that even given the same number of prior medical appointments as so-called normal weight patients, you've got a 25% decreased chance of being screened for colorectal cancer. Those are just some of medicine's psychological problems, but they're leading to diagnostic inaccuracy, inferior consultations, and we know empathy is the cornerstone of treatment compliance, a fact that's been recognized by the World Health Organization. Now, if you perceive that your doctor is listening to you, studies show you're more likely to listen to your doctor in turn. But here's the next surprise. The medical community has known about medicine's psychological problems, its biases, for over 30 years. So why do these problems persist? Why are people still dying and being harmed because of medicine's psychological problems? Why do Hippocratic oaths sometimes become hypocritical oaths? Well, there are many reasons, but I want to talk about three of them. And the first reason is best explained by me posing some questions to you. So, stand up if you're racist. <laughs> stand up if you condescend toward the elderly. Not many people standing up. Um, you know, I guess if you're probably sitting there thinking, well, that's pretty insulting. You might even be thinking, well, you know, you might be like that, but I'm not. Um, but I guess if we're asked these kinds of questions, we don't tend to stand up en masse and declare in a kind of Spartacus-like gesture, I am discriminating. And that, in a nutshell, helps to explain why medicine's psychological problems persist. Because for individual doctors, as for the rest of us, these kinds of disparities and biases are somebody else's problem. But we know from social psychology and cognitive psychology that our implicit biases can leak into our behavior even while we remain resolutely unaware. One example, when polled, around 80% of Americans will declare that they're not racist. But implicit association tests reveal that around 60, between 60 and 75% of people display implicit racial biases. We also know from social psychology that we tend to have a rather rose-tinted view of ourselves. We tend to regard ourselves as above average, better looking, kinder, more pop popular than the average person. And this has been dubbed the Lake Wobegon effect taken from Garrison Keillor's fictional town where everybody, including the children, is above average. And I want to say that medicine resides in Lake Wobegon <laughs> and doctors have a lakeside view. Here's an example. Best-selling New York Times medical writer and chair of medicine at Harvard Medical School says, I can recall every misdiagnosis I made during my 30-year career. Looks like a pretty candid admission. Except studies show that between 10 and 20% of consultations result in misdiagnoses. Maybe Gritman's got a super, superhuman memory. More likely he's deluding himself. And incidentally, this is leading to around death through misdiagnosis in America of around 160,000 people every year. Some people regard that as a conservative estimate. But that is the equivalent of between four to five 9-11s every single month, just on American soil. So introspection, it's a bit like the characters in reality TV shows. It's superficial, shallow, but compelling. So it's got to come with a warning sign. So the second reason medicine's psychological problems persist is Medicine is missing the cognitive revolution, and that includes evolutionary psychology. Now, doctors are Stone Age people, just like the rest of us. We have Paleolithic instincts. So what, like, what looks like modern misbehavior has its roots 
in the old psychology bequeathed to us by evolution. Here's an example. We crave highly calorific foods, foods that were scarce in our hunter-gatherer days. Um, today leads to health problems with an overabundance of such foods. But similarly, we can look to evolution to help explain our psychological tendencies and capacities, why it is we tend to give prolonged preferential attention to people who have more of the good stuff, whether it is good looks, access to fine things, skills, why we find it hard, on the other hand, to give sustained attention to the have-nots, the disadvantaged, the elderly. But in the words of the evolutionary psychologist Jerome Barco, biology is only destiny if we ignore it. In other words, we've got to come to terms with, and medicine's got to come to terms with, our profoundly un-PC home truths about our psychological behaviour. Now, the third reason medicine's psychological problems persist is modern medicine misconceives itself. It's well documented that medical students tend to perceive their curriculum as cleaved into two kinds of courses. So on the one hand, there's the need to know biomedical facts about pharmacology, physiology, anatomy, and so on. And then on the other hand, there's the softer, nice to know facts, behavioral sciences, medical ethics, sociology, psychology, and so on. And I want to argue that this dangerous division is smuggled into the age-old phrase, the art of medicine. Here's an illustration of what I mean. Around 50 medics were polled recently at the University of Alberta in Canada, and they were asked, what does the art of medicine mean to you? Now, the replies were vague and varied, but there was an underlying theme running throughout them all. Um, here's a potpourri of their replies. Medicine has the scientific part, but the art is the communication aspect, the tasteful, emotional side. Or, the art of medicine is about developing your own style of communication. Or as one senior faculty member said, the art of medicine is the difference between being an average doctor and a really good doctor. I want to say that the sentiment, the art of medicine, brings to mind Marshall McLuhan's observation, art is anything you can get away with. <laughs> so we've got to lose the slogan, the art of medicine. Why? Because it carries conceptual baggage. Cognitive linguists tell us that the concepts that we use can influence our thinking. When we think about art, we think about individuality, freedom of expression, certainly something that can't be taught or is not informed by science. But the practice of medicine is informed by science, and ultimately, it needs to be evidence-led. So, the practice of medicine needs an injection of the human sciences. In fact, more than that, it needs to be on an intravenous drip of the human sciences indefinitely. Given medicine's psychological problems, and given some of the reasons that these problems persist, well, what can we hope to do about any of this? There are no easy answers. But here's a few ideas. First of all, in the long term, the digitization of medicine, including the development of diagnostic software, may help to create a level playing field for all patients. But what about the central doctor-patient relationship? Well, we can look to an unlikely source, I would argue, for some tips, and that's the US military. The social psychologist Jack DeVideo was interested in discrimination in the military, and he suggested that the following statement be read to appointment committees. We know that there are good female candidates. We know that there are good black candidates. We don't expect to see underrepresentation of minorities when you're making your appointments. And if we do, we're going to hold you personally responsible. Now, that statement was sufficient to eliminate discrimination. Why? DeVideo says, 
officers were forced to become reflective about all of our implicit biases. Perhaps medicine could deploy similar tactics. But what about all of us? What can all of us do to ensure that we get the right kind of medical attention? Well, we can begin by putting a premium on empathy. And we can do that by going into the consultation and talking to our doctor in the way that we want to be spoken to. And if that isn't reciprocated, we can flag this up with the doctor. If that doesn't work, we can be our own best health advocate by finding a doctor who does give us the right kind of attention. Medicine needs to get mindful. But the psychological revolution in medicine needs us all. Thank you.